Welcome back students. Today we're looking at classification and introduction to taxonomy. My name is Felisa Ricketts and thank you so much for joining. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, now is a good time to do so, so that you can get a notification anytime we post new content. We post on this channel, we post the various subject areas. So if you want content for mathematics, we have that. We have for English, we have for physics, biology, chemistry, physics and the list goes on. So you can subscribe. We also post information for students on how to be successful or tips and tricks to succeed in high school or different areas of your life. So you're at a good place and we hope that you'll have a good time together. Now, let's get right into it. Now for classification and introduction to taxonomy. The first thing that we need to know, we need to know what is classification and we need to know what is taxonomy. Now, classification, this is the grouping of objects or information based on similarities. Now, there are more than one million described species of plants and animals. Many millions of these are still left undescribed. So it's very important for scientists to classify organisms because we want to have them in different groups so that we can study them. Imagine for a minute a world where nothing is classified, we're just existing. What do you think will happen? Think about it for a moment. No, taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of classification, very important term. It's the science of classification, which is grouping things. No, the process of classifying biodiversity based on evolutionary relationships. Taxonomy also means to organize biological diversity or groups and names organisms based on different characteristics. So organisms are named and grouped based on the characteristics that they possess, right? Now systems are early taxonomic systems. Long time ago, we had somebody by the name of Aristotle. What he did, he developed the first widely accepted system of biological classification. Everything was either grouped as plant or animals. So if you're not a plant, you're an animal. You have to fall between one of those two categories. So he had some plants like herbs, shrubs, trees, and for animals, land, sea, air, right? So land was under that group. It's kind of weird, imagine land. Oh, hey land, you're an animal. <laughs> sea, all right, cool. We saw where that was. But eventually somebody else came on the scene and said, you know what, that's probably not working out. Let's do something better. So we had somebody by the name of Carlos Linnaeus, who 1753, he used species name to classify organisms. So organisms were classified based on looking at physical and structural similarities. Similar to today when people look at us and classify us into different groups, but that's what he really used. Now that reveal relationships of organisms. So he used something called the binomial nomenclature. What it does, it gave each species two names. So just like, oh, you have two names, what's your two names? Or what are your two names? My two names are, I said it at the beginning of the video. All right, so each species had two names, just like us. There was a genus name and a species name. Now the genus is a group of similar species. Now, what he did, he developed the modern system of taxonomy. So that's what we really use right now, all right? No. Because Latin was the language he used that time, he used Latin. But the thing is right now, we don't longer, we no longer use Latin. So Latin is not being changed. It's a constant language because we don't use it anymore. So you're not gonna change it. So anywhere in the world that you are, you're able to use that name or those two names to identify a particular organism. Because in Jamaica, we might call it a frog, but when you go to another country, it's a different name. So because scientists want to have a constant naming or constant identification of organisms, they use Latin so that, you know, anywhere we go, it's going to be the same. So the genus name is always capitalized, just like all the beginning of our first name, the first letter is always capitalized. And the species name, it's always lowercase. So both names must be underlined or italicized. Example, Canis lupus, and that's a wolf. 
So anywhere you go in the world, Canis lupus is a wolf. But right here in Jamaica, you might call it a wolf, but you, you go to another country and they call it, let's say, a chicken. Not saying that that's what they do, but you get where I'm going. Another example is homo sapiens. And who are homo sapiens? Yes, you are a homo sapien. Humans are homo sapiens. So that's, you're getting the gist of what's going on so far, right, students? Hope you are. All right, now, <clears throat> we have another one. <clears throat> example, Feliz Domesticus, which is a host cat. So Feliz Domesticus, which is, well, Feliz Domesticus var, indicates more than one variety. So the var right there indicates that there are more than one variety that right there. Now, scientific names are often either descriptive, for example, Acer rubrum right there, red maple. So another way scientific names are also sometimes named after someone, for example, genus linear. Descri or it could be descriptive of where an organism lives, D. californica. So from there you get in where the organism lives. Or scientific names could be named after a person who first described the organism. D. californica tor. Or many organisms have common names. So many organisms actually have common names, which can be misleading. It can have more than one common name, depending on the area it is found in. So many organisms actually have common names, which can be misleading, as we said earlier, based on where the organism is found. So right here, a chicken here might not be a chicken there. A roach there might not be a roach there. So you need scientific names so that it can be constant. So when you go and tell them that you want a chicken, you definitely get a chicken because they're gonna use the scientific names, all right? Hope you're getting the gist of it. So modern taxonomy. Now based on evolutionary relationships, taxonomy study, one, structural similarities, chromosomal structure, reproductive potential, biochemical similarities, and that's comparing DNA and amino acids. Also embryology development. All right. So embryology development. All right, let's go back to where we were. Embryological development, breeding behavior, as well as geographic distribution. So these are some of the things that they study. Now there are seven taxonomic categories. We have kingdom, which is the largest, most general group. Phylum, called a division with plants. We have class, order, family, genus, species, which is the smallest, most specific group. Now you can use something unique to remember these because you have to remember them in the order. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. All right, so you have to know the seven taxonomy categories. So that's a typical exam question. So please take note right here. Now we have group genera into families, families into orders, orders into classes, classes into phyla, and phyla into kingdoms. Species can interbreed with each other. So that's the thing about species, they can interbreed with each other. No, 1969, five kingdom systems. So Monero, Protista, and Fungi kingdoms added to the two established kingdoms. Kingdoms defined based on two main characteristics. Possession of a true nucleus, so it can be prokaryote or eukaryote. How it gets food, that's something that we we'll look at as well, whether it's heterotrophic, autotrophic, or it's a decomposer. So heterotrophic will mean that it depends on other organisms for food. Autotroph will mean that it makes its own food like plants. And you have your decomposers which feed on the dead and decaying remains of organisms, all right? Now in 1980s, we have the three domain system. So the bacteria have distinct differences. All eukaryotic kingdoms grouped into one domain 
we had the Monera kingdom split into two domains, archaea and new bacteria. So right now you can see what's going on right there. So we have bacteria, eukaryota, archaea. And down the bottom, we have our eubacteria, archaeobacteria, protista, fungi, animalia, plantae. How living things are classified? Now, groups of organisms called taxa or taxons. Organisms arrange in groups ranging from very broad to very specific characteristics. Broader taxons have more general characteristics and more species within it. The smallest taxon, species. Largest taxon, kingdom. So the largest one is taxon and the smallest one is a species. Now, you can look at family tree for the evolutionary history of a species. The root of the tree represents the ancestral lineage. Tips of the branches represent descendants of the ancestor. So this is talking about the evolutionary lineage of these organisms or these species. We have cladistics, which is a system of classification based on the phylogeny. We have cladogram. We have dichotomous key, which is a way of identifying organisms by looking at the physical characteristics. It uses a series of questions to group into a hierarchy classification. So example, one A gram positive, we tell it go to two, one B not gram positive, you would go to three and it would keep going. So if you go to two A, cell spherical in shape, and then it would tell you what it is. For to be cells not spherical in shape, and you would go to four if that's what it comes under. All right, so would we'll keep going like that. Now, let's review the first thing that we learned or the first lessons on what language are scientific names based. So answer these questions in your books. On what language are scientific names based? Two, how should the scientific name of a species be written? Three, which part of the name Homo erectus identifies the genus? And four, list in order from smallest to largest the seven categories in Linnaeus's system of classification. So let's write those down. That's going to be your first piece of assignment or classwork. Now you could pause the video there and write these questions off and copy the answers into your books, all right? And then you submit them. Now to the six kingdoms of organisms. Prokaryotes, that's the first one. It's microscopic. Prokaryotic means it lacks a nucleus or they lack a nucleus. They can be autotrophs, photosynthetic or chemosynthetic or heterotrophs they are also unicellular. Now we have two more kingdoms, Archaebacteria and Eubacteria. Mm -hmm. Now your Archaebacteria live in extreme environments like swamps, deep ocean, hydrothermal vents, which are oxygen-free environments, the cell walls are not made of peptidoglycan. Example, methanogens, halophiles. Their eubacteria live in most habitats. Cell walls made of peptidoglycan. Example, E. coli. Do you know where the E. coli is found or where does it live? We have streptococcus as well as cyanobacteria. Continuing, we have protista, which is eukaryotic, which means that it has a nucleus. Some have cell walls of cellulose, some have chloroplast. 
They can be autotrophs or heterotrophs. Some can be fungus-like. Most of them are unicellular. Some are multicellular or colonial. Example, your amoeba, your paramecium, slime, moles, euglena, kelp, lacks complex organ systems and lives in a moist environment. So you'll find your protist in a moist environment. Fungi, eukaryotes, cell walls of cheating, heterotrophs, most multicellular, some are unicellular. Example, mushrooms, yeast. They will absorb nutrients from organic materials in the environment, and they're usually stationary. Have you ever seen a fungi? Your little mushroom things that grow? Plants. Your plants are eukaryotes, cell walls of cellulose. They are autotrophs, meaning that they make their own food. They are multicellular. They're also photosynthetic, which means that they'll photosynthesize or they'll carry out photosynthesis. Contains chloroplast, example, your mosses, your ferns, your trees, flowering plants. They cannot move. Tissues and organ systems. So they have tissues and organ systems. Animalia, this is the most popular of them all, isn't it? Eukaryotes, they do not have a cell wall or chloroplast. Heterotrophs, multicellular, example, sponges, SpongeBob SquarePants, worms, insects, fish, mammals, nurse. They, so mammals now, they nurse their young. So nurse their young, they'll give them breasts and they're mobile. So let's do some revision. In taxonomy, each level of classification is referred to as a or an. Number two, characteristics that appear in recent parts of a lineage but not in its older members are called. Tell me the answers. Number three, the group of organisms that can be larger than a kingdom is called a. Is it domain, species, phylum, or class? Pause the video here and let's answer these questions in your notebooks and send it to me when you're finished. All right? Okay, guess what students? We are at the end of another exciting video. Now complete your activities. There are some questions that I'm going to be giving you as a little quiz, a bonus quiz right now. So let's go. If you have any questions, please comment in the comment section. Remember to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed already, I'm going to be posting more videos. I have an experiment coming out soon in chemistry. So please look out and see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. My name is Felisa Ricketts, tuning out. All right.